On March 4th, 2020, the Disney Pixar movie Onward was officially released in theaters. In the weeks leading up to the film's release, there was a lot of press and subsequent controversy surrounding what was being labeled as the first openly LGBT character in Disney Pixar history. That label isn't technically wrong. In terms of films produced under the Disney Pixar name, Onward was the first to feature an openly LGBT character. However, the statement itself can be a bit misleading. People took this to mean that Onward would be the first Disney movie to have an openly LGBT character. If that headline sounds familiar to you, it's likely because you've already seen it. Over the past few years, Disney hasn't been afraid of declaring their first LGBT characters in certain fields of their company. First there was the discussion surrounding Oaken and Frozen due to the implication that he had a husband. Then there was Disney claiming that LeFou from Beauty and the Beast was their first openly gay character. And last year there were even articles about the new High School Musical Disney Plus series having the franchise's first ever queer romance. For me, seeing Disney find new ways to indicate that they're the first at various things in their own company just feels performative, especially when you consider what the actual representation ends up being. Aside from the High School Musical queer romance, which I think actually does take a sincere approach to the topic, all of these so-called openly LGBT characters are assigned barely any screen time or even space in their respective narratives, making the representation almost non-existent. It's only possible to see Oaken's husband if you pay careful attention to a few frames, LeFou's gayness is only present in a brief moment, and Officer Spectre in Onward only has a single line about her girlfriend. To call this explicit LGBT representation feels a bit disingenuous when you consider who Disney is marketing to. From my perspective, it feels like Disney is trying not to take a side when it comes to how they portray LGBT individuals in media. By having openly LGBT characters in their films that are only noticeable if you're looking for them, Disney can avoid alienating bigoted audience members while also being able to soak up all of the pro-LGBT publicity that they can possibly get. I do like the queer romance in High School Musical the Musical the series, but it's worth noting that that is not part of the mainstream Disney canon, and it's significantly less high profile than the aforementioned movies. Though Disney as a company appears to have an LGBT-friendly demeanor in some ways, they're pretty coy about distributing that attitude across all parts of the company. As you've seen me speak about in previous videos, the presence of LGBT experience and presumably queer-coded characters in the Disney catalog can be seen whether or not the studio wants to acknowledge it. If you want to learn more about the precedent for that, I recommend you check out my video on queer coding in Disney villain songs. To reiterate why I'm using the word queer and not gay, let me clarify that the point of this analysis is not to say that there are characters in Disney films that identify as LGBT. However, historically there have been many characters in media that challenge notions of cis-heteronormativity through presentation, voice, or just how they interact with other characters. For me, the word queerness is a succinct way of referring to these types of supposed deviations from the norm, so that's why I'm using that word. However, when speaking about queer-coded Disney characters, there's always one that's consistently left out. To show you what I mean, we'll have to go back to the year 1938 to talk about the Oscar-winning short film Ferdinand the Bull. One, two, be three, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. In 1935, the author Monroe Leaf would spend an afternoon spontaneously writing a children's story about a bull. He did this with the intention of having his friend Robert Lawson be the illustrator, giving Lawson room to show off his style. This short story would eventually become the story of Ferdinand, a children's book published in 1936 by Viking Press. The book told a story about a Spanish bull named Ferdinand who grew up feeling distance from his peers. Though he felt pressure to play with the other calves in preparation of eventually joining the bullfights in Madrid, Ferdinand preferred to sit under a cork tree and smell the flowers. His mother let him live his life the way he wanted to due to the fact that he didn't seem unhappy or isolated. All of the bulls would continue to grow up, but Ferdinand never lost his interest in sitting under the cork tree and smelling flowers. One day five men came to pick a new bull to bring with them to Madrid, and Ferdinand didn't think much of it. However, while sitting underneath the cork tree, he was stung by a bee and quickly felt energized, leaving him to be mistaken for an aggressive bull and subsequently taken to Madrid under the name Ferdinand the Fierce. While in the arena, Ferdinand was drawn to flowers in the hair of audience members, causing him to run to the center of the arena and just smell the flowers. 
Emperors. This made the humans upset, resulting in them sending Ferdinand back home. The story ends with Ferdinand going back to sitting under the cork tree, smelling flowers, with the implication being that he's happy doing exactly what he loves to do. The story of Ferdinand quickly became popular, with Life magazine saying that it was the greatest juvenile classic since Winnie the Pooh, even saying that three out of four adults who purchased the book will likely do so for their own amusement. The book had many admirers, and was hailed as a masterpiece within the genre. However, not everyone was enthusiastic about the story. Hitler burned the book due to it being an example of supposedly degenerate art, and supporters of Francisco Franco were upset that it appeared to be a book about pacifism that was released two months after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. The book was a hit in the United States, inspiring Disney to create their own animated short based on the story. The Disney version is mostly faithful to the original, featuring a straight narration of the story that only has slight details changed. On its own, the story is relatively simple and can be used as an analogy for a variety of things. It can be read as a pacifist tale, but it can also be read as a story about a young bull who is interested in things outside of stereotypical gender roles. However, at its core, it's simply a story about Ferdinand trying to stay true to himself. The reason why I'm talking about this story on a music channel is because of the song that Disney made to go with the film. Despite the song being cut from the final short, Disney still distributed it in advance as a promotional tool. The song Ferdinand the Bull describes the plot points of the short film, but introduces queerness into the equation in a way that feels more explicit than the original story. For example, the original story does not place too much emphasis on Ferdinand's interests affecting his gender presentation or gender role. However, the song adds a dimension to the story that does assert that, making frequent comparisons that essentially suggest that Ferdinand is more of a female than a male. Ferdinand, Ferdinand, the bull with the delicate ego. Ferdinand, Ferdinand, the heifers all called him amigo. Ferdinand, Ferdinand, he'd curtsy and greet them politely. Now he knew how to tango and dance the fandango. But he never learned to fight. For example, references to him being friends with heifers shows that he socializes in a different crowd than he is assigned. Saying that Ferdinand would curtsy while greeting somebody feels like a stereotypical callback to how women within this patriarchal lens were expected to greet others. References to cologne and having a delicate ego also feel very reminiscent of gay stereotypes of the 1900s that would assert that gay men were oversensitive and had prissy taste. The lines about his mooing being too refined for the others also introduces language into the equation, something that definitely evokes the way that gay men are stereotyped for having certain speech patterns, distancing them from society. He was gentle and kind, and his moo was refined, which the rest of the bulls all resented. For when he'd start to moo in a moment or two, he'd have all the cows discontented. However, possibly the biggest allusion to queerness that appears in the song is the last line. When the picador missed him, why Ferdinand kissed him? For he never learned to fight. This line feels particularly pointed, showing how the song itself has a starkly different tone from the original story. In the story, Ferdinand's happiness is not affected by how society treats him. He clearly does not fulfill the archetype that he's expected to fit into, but he's perfectly content with that. The story is centered around him being true to himself, strongly implying that the society is wrong for trying to force him to be someone he isn't. The Disney song feels different, instead making Ferdinand the butt of the joke. Ferdinand's eccentric personality is not only directly compared to gender, but it's also repeatedly emphasized that he does what he does instead of fighting. Even when encouraged to fight, Ferdinand can't help but kiss his opponents due to his dainty nature. Ferdinand's eccentricities don't make him unique in the retelling of the story, but instead set him up to be the token gay joke in a novelty song. The song changes the concept of the short film for me, making me look at the specific animations for Ferdinand differently. I feel like I have a grasp on the message of the original story, but the Disney one still eludes me, due to the song seemingly betraying its origin. Ferdinand the Bull would go on to win an Oscar in 1938 in the category of Best Short Subject. The accompanying novelty song would go on to become a hit in certain respects, being performed by many groups and being featured on a variety of Disney Greatest Hits collections and songbooks. In fact, a recording of the song was even made as recently as 1992 by the American singer Michael Feinstein. For me, the song itself leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It feels like it was not made in good faith and perpetuates stereotypical jokes about effeminate men instead of the story's original message, that it's perfectly okay to do what makes you happy regardless of what society says. However, I think a strangely beautiful thing about LGBT culture is how flexible it can 
reaching B. In a world that's not very accepting of LGBT individuals, there's an important power in reclaiming narratives. Though I wasn't initially a fan of the Ferdinand the Bull song, I think, like all things, the meaning can drastically change depending on the context. When I sing it, it feels more anthemic and proud, almost like a queer anthem. As Disney continues to ease into more LGBT issues, it's important to remember the necessary aspects of productive representation. By doing that, we can hold media accountable and start to gain agency over our own narratives. However, that's definitely a long-term goal. For now, it's very comforting for me to think that Disney's first queer character was actually an eccentric bull from 85 years ago who didn't stop smelling flowers, no matter what was expected of him. Ferdinand, Ferdinand, he smiled when the picador faced him. Ferdinand, Ferdinand, he winked and the picador chased him. Ferdinand, Ferdinand. Occasion so lightly when the picador missed him. Why, Ferdinand kissed him, for he never learned to fight. When the picador missed him, why, Ferdinand kissed him, for he never learned to fight. <laughs>